Hello everyone, today is Thursday, August 17, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everyone for showing up. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. All right, so what do we talk about? Well, I left this slide in from last week, so I need to update it. But we're going to basically cover current market conditions when we get to the charts, obviously. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. And when we get to the stocks, if you don't mind, just ask about one at a time. Hold off on your stock picks now to make sure I get to your questions. And again, just ask about one at a time. And that way, I can make sure I cover your stocks, all of your stocks. So you can ask about as many as you want. Just hit enter after each one. Now, um, winter is coming. We talked about that last week. And I'm going to rehash a few things on that. And then the main focus this week is going to be 10 things that you need to know about trend. And we'll just hop right into that. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. If you get really bored, you can go read that disclaimer on my site. A lot of interesting things in there, like uh, if you smoke after sex, you're doing too fast, etc. I like to always sum it up by just saying all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So I woke up this morning thinking that with the market looking a little questionable, now might be a good time to talk about just trends in general and trend following. And so I started poking around my website and I found an article I did about a year and a half ago on trends and I'll probably freshen that up over the next few days maybe tomorrow if uh, God willing but the original article was you want to trade trends well you better know these 10 things now the first one as we discussed last week is that markets go up and markets go down now again that's a bit of a captain obvious type of statement, but you'd be surprised at how many people fight trends. And I have the luxury of being able to see the world preaching a good gospel on trend following and people, and I've met a lot of people who claim to be trend followers. But then when I talk to them, they're like, yeah, I'm down 30% in this position. Or in one case, I was thinking about um, this morning, I met somebody in Hong Kong and the Hang Seng was down 30% and they were down 30% on their stocks. Yet he claimed that he was a trader. Now, there's nothing wrong with losing money trading. Trust me, we all will lose money more than we care to lose, right? That's a whole other conversation. But if you're a trend follower and the market has already dropped 30% and you're still heavily long, then the chances are you're probably not using stops. And in this particular case, I believe he was also down 30%, just like the market. Well, now he's caught in a tough situation where he felt like he was trapped. And he, I guess in some cases he was. If he sold now, then it's it's too low to sell. What what what's gonna happen? You know, what if it turns right back around and goes right back up? Well, that's gonna Lead us to our next point in one minute here. But remember that a market can only exist in three different states. Either a state of demand, a state of supply, or a state of equilibrium. So if you ever find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or wondering if it's a third of a fifth or a fifth of a third, in your wave count, come back to the fact that it's either going up, it's either going down, or sideways. There's either demand, there's either demand, let me try to say that again, there's either demand, supply, or equilibrium where demand is equal to supply. And by the way, people are anti, the people that are anti technical analysis and their fundamentals, I was like, well, what could be more fundamental than supply? demand, and equilibrium. 
Now, the market might not be doing what you want it to do. Oh, it's not showing it? Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks for... Uh... Sorry about that. Oh, man, there's some good slides in there, too. Huh? Let's see what we missed. All right, not too much. Uh, Ten things you need to know about trends. Markets go up, markets go down. Captain Obvious. <laughs> so, again, a market. thank you for uh, letting me know, Jim. Uh, slides are better than your mug. Thank you, Phil. I know that. I have a face radio. But it doesn't stop me from putting it out there. <laughs> so you always truly need to ask yourself, again, is it supply, demand, or equilibrium? Now, it might not be what you want, but... Unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. Now, getting back to the gentleman I talked about in Hong Kong, he was already down 30% and he felt like it was too late to sell. Well, you have to remember that it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. So a market might be low. But never forget that it could always go much lower. And the example I've used often in this, and you could just pick any, most any stock chart you want that's headed lower. But the NASDAQ is a great example because it's, it's something that you wouldn't think could lose 70-something percent of its value. Now, it sure did seem like a bargain when it was down 50%. Now, I met somebody a while back that, that actually promoted the fact that if the market's ever down 50%, you should sell options like there's no tomorrow. And, and I'm not going to point out who it is, but there was somebody who claims to be a major value player, and they did sell options when the market was down 50%, and they made a lot of money doing it. Well, if the market would have continued to drop, they would have lost a substantial amount of money. So just because something is low – doesn't mean that it can't go lower. So here's a NASDAQ, and you can see right around 2001, one had to wonder, is this the end or nearing the end? You can see after all was said and done, it was down over 70%. I forget the exact number. I have to look it up. But if somebody knows, let me know. It was, it was ridiculous, like 74% or something like that. Close enough. You get the idea. Now, another captain obvious statement is the only way to profit from a trade, or any trade that is, for that matter, is to capture a trend. So you might say, well, I'm a counter trend player. Well, guess what? A trend better come along soon. Otherwise, you're not going to make any money on a trade. So I know, again, captain obvious, you must sell higher then you buy. So my whole feeling is why not be a trend follower all the time? It's the only way you could ever make money on a trade. So why not always be a trend follower? To me, it's a no brainer But you'd be surprised at how many people fight trends and how many people attempt. And I use the word attempt, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But I really haven't met anyone who can successfully use some of these more arcane methods. It, to me, it just seems mostly academic. And trust me, I've studied everything under the sun. But they'll be fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting trends. And by the way, I guess I need to add a few more of these things as I'm putting these slides together. I'm thinking maybe there's a couple of more I need to put in here. Like everything works better with trend. I have seen some people do some pretty amazing things with some arcane type of methodologies. I've seen people count waves and do amazingly well in a year like 2008, 2007, 2008, on the way down. Well, it just so happened that the market was in a downtrend and it corresponded with the wave count. And it was a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, 
when the market began to turn, what happened? They began fighting the trend because it was suggesting yet another leg down, but the trend had turned. So everything works better with trend. I know someone who made an ungodly amount of money. I'm like, please take the money or half the money, whatever, and pay off all your debts, pay off your house so you have a free place to live. And then if you're that sure about the markets and things are that great, then by all means, take the other half of your money or whatever's left after you take care of everything and rinse and repeat, do it again. Now, there's a beautiful concrete rule when it comes to technical analysis and no other methods. You can't say that, with fundamentals, that is, you can't say that, well, if the PE is this, you should buy it. Now, by the way, I do use PE, but I just use a numerator. So in case you guys are wondering, PE, that's a PE ratio. This is price and this is earnings. I use the PE, but I wipe out the numerator. I'm sorry, denominator. I just use a numerator, which is price. Okay. By the way, this is something that Greg Morris often points out in his speeches is that the most fundamental of all indicators, the price earnings ratio, PE, has price as its numerator, which I find fascinating. But anyway, the most beautiful rule or beautiful thing about technical analysis is there is a hard and fast rule. It's inescapable. It's like gravity. If a market is going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B. So if it's at 5 and it's going to 20, it's going to have to pass through 10 somewhere along the way. Again, it's a hard and fast rule. It's inescapable. Now, it's not just as simple as buying at B, although I do have an IPO pattern that does just that. But you get the idea. You'll do much better off trying to figure out how to buy somewhere around B and get on a trend once you believe it's established than you will fighting a trend. And trying to catch a bottom. Leave that bottom picking and top picking to the gurus. And as I often preach, they tend to predict early and often. And when they finally get it right, they shout it from the rooftops. And in some cases, they get it right once in their career, and that's their entire career. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because we're only as good as our next trade in this business, right? There's been a lot of careers have been launched by calling tops and getting it right once. <laughs> now, remember that indicators don't indicate trend or anything for that matter. But they can help to illustrate what's already there. People send me all kinds of stuff all the time. And telling me, oh, this is a great predictor of this, and this indicator will, will it's a leading indicator. It's forward-looking or whatever. It's like, no, it's not. Any price-based indicator, okay, this is your price, okay? And then your indicator is going to look back in time and make some sort of calculations on all this to calculate the indicator, okay? Now, I do occasionally use moving averages because they can be wonderful illustrators, okay? They can help to illustrate what's already there. So, as I often say, daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, let's say this low here and this moving average here, which is the 50, can help to keep you on the right side of the market. The slope of the moving average can help to keep you on the right side of the market. But they don't indicate anything. I mean, now the daylight is a fairly powerful concept because you can see once you have daylight, 
it suggests possibly that the trend has turned and or a new trend is developing. But what a moving average can help you to do also, or any other indicator for that matter, and I don't use any other ones other than moving average, is it can show you that, okay, look, this moving average has turned down. Well, lo and behold, price has turned down. This moving average has turned down. Well, price obviously has turned down. And this one has turned down, also has a negative slope, okay? Now, notice that in this particular case, they all three crossed over at a fairly tight fulcrum point across the 50-day moving average. This is a 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential. These are my bow tie moving averages, okay? So the, cross, the fact that they crossed over and now are in downtrend proper order suggests that maybe a downtrend is developing. And by the way, who let the dogs out? <laughs> anyway, um, you can see once they cross over like this over a tight period, it suggests that possibly the cycles have changed. Now, the reason I say possibly is nothing's, nothing's for sure. If anything is for sure, well, nothing's for sure. But if something was for sure, you should put all your money into it. And you know, in the world, I mean, think about casinos. They have a very tiny edge. I mean, not on something like a slot machine or something that sucks you in. But on the board games, their edge really isn't that big. But it's, but it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. And sometimes a casino loses, but longer term they will not because it is a 100% statistical distribution, a normal distribution, whereas markets aren't normally distributed. There's a lot more outliers than there should be. So if there was a way to have some sort of concrete way of saying you will always make this much in the market, then you could put all your money into it. In fact, even better, leverage up, mortgage everything, mortgage your house, leverage up, do whatever it takes, beg, bar, and steal some money, and then parlay that money. Well, it's not quite so easy. A lot of times what you do is an educated guess at best, and sometimes you get knocked out more often than you want trying to ride a trend, which we'll get into in just one second. And by the way, so while we're in the rusty, you can see we do have this bow tie down. Sometimes I like to put the 50 in here just to give you a point of reference. When you have a fairly sharp crossing across the 50 and you get that fulcrum right around the 50, a lot of times that helps to validate the signal. So, yes, the moving averages have turned down. The moving averages are in downtrend proper order. So that suggests that something's wrong, right? Well, look at where the Russell was and look at what happened recently. And, yes, it had a pretty serious slide. Not the end of the world, about 5 or 6%, I think, but a pretty serious slide nonetheless. Now, this brings us to our next point, the net net price change. You can never forget about the net net. Now, you guys and girls are getting smarter in here. At least over the summer, I think the, the crowd intelligence has gone up tremendously just because we don't have as many new people in here during the summer. I think people are off on vacation, whatever. And when fall comes around, they start looking into trading again. But as a general statement, if you don't believe me about the importance of net net, watch a couple of the archives of this show and you'll see people ask about stocks that have gone absolutely nowhere for months sometimes and even longer. But they're trying to trade a trim. So if you didn't know anything about technical analysis, then just ask yourself, is the market higher, lower or about the same? than it was. But Dave, how far back do you go? Well, days, weeks, months, years, okay? And just see what's happening. Now, if you go back to that Russell chart, the Russell on a daily chart has turned down. The Russell on a daily chart has bow tied down. That doesn't necessarily mean that the bear market is coming, but it means we need to pay attention to what's happening there. If we get a weekly signal, that's going to be even more powerful. So look at the daily, look at the re where, where's the market a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and even a few years ago.
And is it higher, lower, or about the same? Now, another thing about trend is surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. Again, nothing is certain. We've gotten whacked a couple times this year. It's really kind of effed up the portfolio on a couple occasions so far this year. A couple of spankings that did not necessarily occur with the trend. But as a general statement, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. If there is something wrong with the stock, usually people, some insiders will know or somebody will know. And somehow that gets out and the stock may begin to drop. And as that stock stock drops, it could be get even more selling. And in, in this particular case, you can see this is one we were short way back when I did the original column on this. And they had an earnings miss. And notice that the stock imploded. There's no guarantee. You want to guarantee, go buy a toaster, as I often preach. But as a general statement, surprises do tend to happen in the direction of the trend. So if you're long, as I'll show a long example in just one second, and it's in a pretty good trend, well, there's a good chance that whatever fundamental reasons, I know I said the F word, but whatever fundamental reasons the stock is going higher will likely continue to have positive fundamentals and positive news. Now, one thing you have to remember is, and I've been thinking about, and I know I, I beat the dead horse a lot of times on patience, and I've been every every week when I come in here, I think I'm going to do some more on patience, and I just haven't gotten back to it. There's just so many other things that I want to cover. But I think it's probably time for me to do a whole show just on patience. And you're thinking, oh, geez, Dave, you're always preaching that. It's like, you know, I asked my wife, you know, what do you think about the column? Well, you say a lot of the same shit. It's like, well... I'm going to keep saying the same stuff until you people get it. Not you people here live, but you know what I'm saying. But a lot of people simply don't have patience, and trends aren't like a bus. You have to grind it out, grind it out, grind it out, grind it out, grind it out. And who was it, Ken Lambert? We do a lot of research, paraphrasing him, I should say. We do a lot of research that we never use. Well, that's me every day. And a lot of times after a couple hours looking at charts, I can't find a damn thing. I'm like, well, that was an exercise of futility. It's like, no, it wasn't because maybe I will. Now, summers tend to suck, to put it mildly. But every now and then there is a nice little trend that comes along. I can think back to between Christmas and New Year's, horrible time to trade. And I can think back to one trade that was absolutely beautiful that I did not take. And it was in Martha Stewart MSO, Omni Living, I think, or whatever it was. And it was a beautiful short. I didn't take it because it was in, in between Christmas and New Year's. Well, that stock began to implode. I think that's when Mrs. Stewart had all the problems. So trends can come along any time of year, even in the summer. You have to do your homework. And you have to be really, 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 really patient. Now, one thing that I often talk about is African Queen Syndrome, and it's kind of a silly analogy, but it's a good old movie. If you, ha if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But what happened was the, how do I describe the cat? It was, um, it was Bogey and, was it Hepburn? I always get them mixed up. I think it was Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn and uh, Bogey. They were in this little boat, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. And they fought off, I guess it was Nazis and all these other people and leeches and animals and insects and all these different things trying to get down to the lake, going down this river, rapids and gunfire. And they felt like if they could just get to the lake, they'd be home free. Well, they give up. 
and they're like really close to the lake. And I'm not going to ruin the movie for you. Spoiler alert. <laughs> it's a 60 year old movie. But anyway, so a lot of people, the point I'm trying to make is they give up and they're like right before big trend comes along. And the longer the market goes sideways, the bigger the trend is going to be because traders usually don't agree on price for very long. When this Russell finally cracks, if it cracks to the downside, we're going to have the mother of all downtrends. If it goes up and starts making new highs, we could have the mother of all uptrends. But most people with trend following give up right about here because they can't take it anymore. Well, it requires a tremendous amount of patience. And a lot of times, again, you know, you must be present to win. But during this time, there, there might not be anything to do. And you just have to grind it out day after day after day after day. So this is the African queen. I went down to the Keys to get a picture for you guys because I spare no expense when it comes to doing this column. And it actually looks a lot bigger because the way I've got it stretched out in here, it's a little tiny boat. And for um, a handsome sum, they will take you on a boat ride in it. But that's the actual boat that was used in the movie. Now, trends are hard to ride. Covell once equated it to a bouncing Bronco, trying to ride a bouncing Bronco. And the later versions of his book, he put a Bronco on the cover. And, you know, in an ideal world, a trend would look something like this. Well, we're not living in an ideal world. They're going to fake you out and shake you out. In fact, I actually, one of my patterns, the trend knockout, is just that. If you have this big sharp sell off in a really nice trend, one you can draw a big arrow in, we know that this has likely shaken some people out. Everything I do has a psychological backing to it, meaning that I'm reading the psychology of the market. I know if the market sells off hard, people have gotten knocked out of that trend. They might be looking to get back in. I know the Johnny come lately the people who bought way up here have likely gotten knocked out. Those who bought very late to trend with very little staying power and very little patience are getting knocked out. I know that shorts are likely piling on. So they are very hard to ride. And a couple of uh, market adages, which I picked up from Linda Rasky or uh, just in case she's watching today, we were, we've been emailing back and forth. Um, but I'm not name dropping. I'm just giving her credit. But a, a market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most. It will also do the most obvious in the most unobvious way. And I asked her about those adages. And she said she didn't come up with them. She probably picked them up on the floor. So she's very modest in that. But I give her credit. And her point is that like the bouncing Bronco, the trend will have a lot of shakeouts along the way to cause the most pain in the most amount of people. And also they will do things to, they will do the obvious things in an unobvious manner. They will have a big shakeout looking like they're going to roll over and then turn around and go right back up because everybody and their brother will start piling on thinking, well, this is it. And then they go right back up. So very hard to ride trends, but guess what? That's where the money is. Now, you can't predict them, but you can follow them forever. As I preach, no one knows exactly where a market is headed. Not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. So this is one that set up a while back as the aforementioned trend knockout. Nice little sharp sell off. And it looked like a decent setup to me. It looked at the least like it had the potential to bounce. But I had no idea that it would keep headed higher. And so far, it's the biggest winner we've had this year. So... As Greg Morris has pointed out to me, 
follow is the keyword in trend following. In order to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. So we did have a nice trend here. We got on. We didn't know it was going to happen. But so far, it's turned out to be a fairly decent trend. Knock on wood. So you can't predict them. You can take an educated guess that they might resume, at least for a swing trade. And if they do, stick around longer term, just in case they turn into a longer term trend. I'm often asked, in fact, if you go back and read the original column, I was any time I speak, I get asked, how long is your holding period? I was asked back in Traders Expo, I guess it was February 2016. Probably was asked again in 2017. How long is your holding period? It's like, well, hopefully at least 10 years. Well, the money management will often take me out much sooner. But this is the ultimate goal. Well, how long do you catch these big how often do you catch these big trends? Not very often. Okay. And that's what makes it tough. And as I've often said before, it could be pretty streaky. You never know when these big trends will come along. Every now and then you'll catch a few of them and you'll start printing money and you'll feel like God. And by the way, when that does happen, you can't let it go to your head. Just like the aforementioned gentleman, like, please cash out, or cash out of something, pay off your, your mortgage. I've seen people quit jobs. Tell a boss to F off. It's like, hey, I get this thing. I'm on. I'm all on, Dave. I'm all in, Dave. It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> My friend, I was thinking about him this morning, and I might be headed to India this fall. And a, a buddy of mine, Joe Corona, who was back, he, he wrote back in the trading markets days. I don't know if any of you guys remember that, but way back when the earth was still cooling. And he told me, that he likes for the new guys to have their ass handed to him right away. He was uh, he used to travel the world in search of volatility. He was in down Australia for a while, and he said that was a lot more fun than India. He would sit on uh, was it Bondi Beach and watch the girls play topless uh, volleyball in the middle of the day. They'd go have a beer and watch them, and then go back to work. That sounds like fun. Anyway, before I digress too far, I get in trouble in case my wife's listening. <laughs> Joe would travel the world looking for volatility. And when he was in India, he told me, he goes, Dave, I like the new guys to have, for them to have their ass handed to them right away. He says, the guys that start out and they catch some really big trends and make a lot of money. They don't know what hits them when, when it finally does. And they risk too much and they blow up. But the new guys, because obviously they need the money, and let's be frank, we all need the money, right? But when they had their ass handed to them right away, they learn to respect risk. And then they, they learn to just grind it out, and that conditions won't always be great. The worst thing can happen to people is that they start when times are really, really good. And then they begin to think that, well, this market is this permanent income producing machine. They have this permanent income hypothesis. And that's a fancy MBA term that states whatever is happening now will always be that way, will always be that good. And it won't be. And the flip side of that is also true, obviously, and that goes back to the African queen syndrome. It's like if things are choppy, they're going to get better. That I can guarantee. So good times follow bad and bad times follow good. The problem is the timing is very difficult to get exactly right. I'm not sure who said it, but if somebody knows, let me know. Somebody once said, don't give me timing, give me time. And big moves do take time to, to evolve. And if you stick around long enough, you'll catch some nice moves. But you can see in this particular case here, this is a, a good dead money report. Triggers, it didn't meanders, meanders. Well, that doesn't look like much, but that's like a month. You had to sit in a trade breaking even at best. 
And then it finally began to take off, but didn't do a whole lot. So now you're stuck in this thing another month, and you made a little bit. You're feeling okay, but not great. There's got to be something better out there, right? And then it takes off. Oh, okay, well, this is pretty good. And then what happens for one, two, two and a half months? Nothing. Dead money. Then it takes off. And then one, two, two and a half months? Nothing. Okay? And if you pick some of these peaks and troughs, you'll look back a month or so, maybe six weeks even, and you're like, you know what? I've lost money in this stock for six weeks. But you still haven't been stopped out. And then it takes off again. Won't always work this way. But as you can see, it's worth it when it does. And then, you know, getting back to the Rasky quote, look what it did here. Gap's higher. Looks like it's, it's headed to the moon. Turns around and sells off hard. Outside day down. That's a very bearish type of signal. I think the candle people call it a sumo wrestler who just, I don't know, pregnant sumo wrestler or something. I don't know what they call it. But then the market turned around and went right back up. All right. There they are. Seeing on the screen. All right, let me get through these questions. Okay, good, Donald. We'll we'll uh, we'll take a look at that when we get to the charts. Uh, Russell, uh, Donald's talking about the fact that the Russell 2000, 2000 is uh, probing its 200-day. Okay, last week we talked about winter is coming, so let's just do a little bit of follow-up on that, a little bit of recap. Now, by winter is coming, I mean there's a bear market on the horizon. When? I don't know. Okay? So I'm not going crazy bearish on you. I'm just saying now's the time to be prudent with the Russell 2000 having a sell signal with all these other things we talked about last week. And I would urge you, if you can't, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, to go back in and watch last week's Dave Landers of the Week in Charts and then read my last column, which I did, I think, the day after on winter is coming. Now say it's coming, I didn't say it's here, all right? And the analogy I used was the Game of Thrones analogy where it's been six years for winter to show up. So it might, hopefully it'll be another six years, okay? Whenever I say anything bearish, people get all pissed off. It's like, hey, look, dude, markets go up and markets go down. Don't shoot me, okay? I'm just a messenger. I used to get into heated debates with people. You're always bearish. I'm like, no, I'm not always bearish. I am known as a trend-following moron. And if I could draw a big blue arrow on the chart, then I'm bullish. In fact, when we get to the S&P 500, you'll see that it's not too far from all-time highs. So I'm not going to go crazy bearish. We are 100% long in the portfolio right now. But Dave, if you're worried, why don't you get out? No, well, who knows? Maybe that stock we just looked at might double or triple or quadruple from where it is. A stop will take us out. Win. Not if, when, not if, we're wrong. So I think it's better to err on the side of being a little cautious. Now, what's your game plan? Well, read the column, but just to recap, the first thing you want to do is the same thing you always do, and that is to honor your stops on any existing positions. We got knocked out of one during this little slide last week and we have two left and then a new one triggered yesterday but that's that's getting confusing but but on the existing portfolio honor your stops now out of those two that are left maybe one of them the chem will continue to run higher maybe the other one c and dt will finally start moving we've been sitting in that stock forever and it just finally went into the plus column but you don't want to panic and make any drastic decisions. That's what trend following is. You're not going to look smart being a trend follower. And that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me was somebody calling me a trend following moron. And initially I was all pissed off. But if you read a lot of these business books and self-development books, etc., they'll tell you that that coming through adversity and criticism 
is what makes you. It's kind of like the Nietzsche thing. It doesn't destroy you, it makes you stronger. Well, initially I was very hurt. And I sometimes I kind of wear my feelings on my sleeve, you know. And I was really bummed out, especially because I knew who said it. And it's somebody I had utmost respect for. But I began to embrace it. And what's the saying? Wear that shit like a badge, you know? I'm proud of it now. I actually have trend following moron buttons. And I don't know what the market's going to do next. But I know how to recognize a trend. And I can work hard to get on the trend. And then work hard to stay with the trend. Now, I say work hard. It's hard if you're sitting there watching every little tick. But it's actually not that hard if you just let the stop take you out. And you know when you're wrong. When you're wrong, you're wrong. You have to get out. Now, the point I was making last week is we had a lot of debacle du jours recently. A lot of stocks broke down. And sometimes just one of those stocks in and of itself can take down a subsector. And if it doesn't take down a subsector by itself, a lot of times that one stock sort of cast a pall upon the rest of the stocks within the subsector, and then the subsector begins to drop. Now, keep in mind that an index is made up of sectors, a sector is made up of subsectors, and subsectors are made up of individual stocks. So it can have a bit of a domino effect. So the subsector can begin to start taking down the sector and certainly change the sentiment on the overall sector. And then that can weigh on the indices. Now remember, or never forget, that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, many of which have nothing to do with the underlying stock. So if a stock begins dropping or the overall market begins dropping, somebody might need money, okay? Somebody will likely need money and get spooked out. So the market could start trending lower. The economy could be great. Everything could be hunky-dory. But if the sentiment changes and people begin to sell, the market will drop. By the way, never forget that it takes sustained buying to keep a market headed higher. And it takes new buyers coming into the market. And as long as that happens, the market will continue to trend. There's no way to quantify that, but it's just kind of good to know. And what's the old saying? Margin call. Markets will often fall on their own weight. All right. Uh, these random thoughts are left in from last week. Again, I'm not going crazy bearish on you. It's not the end of the world, nor can you see from here. And I'm hoping for the best, but bracing for the worst. And I know you should never use the word hope in this business, but hey, you got to be an optimist. You know, I mean, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. Was that Stephen Wright? <laughs> now, Keep in mind that if the market can go on to make new highs, that it keeps everyone happy and it forces in the reluctant. And it also forces back in people who might have gotten knocked out vis-a-vis -vis, or along the lines, I should say, of the trend knockout pattern. Now, remember, a market's job is to confuse and confound the most. Margin call. <laughs> All right, a couple of announcements and we'll hop right in. Uh, I guess I need to stop saying it's here because it's been here for a while, but it took me two years to get this thing out. So I'm very proud of it, worked really hard on it. Check it out. Um, a lot of the slides you see in these presentations, as you can tell from the, the little logo on them, come directly from the course. But if you go to this URL here, you could actually start watching for free and a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I beat the dead horse on I know Dave I can't wait to hear you say, say the same thing again <laughs> is in those uh, first few uh, free videos first four videos but anyway check it out please I ask you and thank you all right let's hop into the charts uh, here's my email if you have any unanswered questions 
if you don't get them answered today. To those of you who are watching the recording of this. All right, let's take a look at the overall market, and let's take a look at what Donald's pointing out. Let's start with the Rusty, I guess, because that's what we were just talking about. Let's throw in the uh, 50, let's throw in the 100-day moving average. I'm sorry, 200-day moving average. That's the 50. Let's throw in the 200. So the market is testing its 200-day moving average. Great observation. By the way, I usually only plot the 50 and or the 200 when the market is questionable simply because they're well watched. Now, the 50 simple and 200 simple moving averages, 50-day simple, 200-day simple moving average. And the reason you should take a look at those every now and then is because they're well watched. As long as the market is obviously headed higher, there's nothing to worry about. But yes, as Donald said, it is being tested. Now, what's kind of interesting is we've had daylight since 2016. Now, I'm not suggesting that you buy a market just because there's daylight or sell a market just because there's daylight. But it's amazing how daylight can often keep you on the right side of the market. Now, we're discretionary traders, so we use that to help us build the case. Yes, the market looks like it's trending longer term here. And you can see since about a year and a month, it's headed higher. But now it's testing that 200 moving average. Let's take a look at the 50 real quick. So looking at the 50, you can see that it's now broken down below it, obviously, and now there's daylight below it. And by the way, if you're using daylight to help you with trend, don't get super bearish just because you have a day or two below it or a day or two above it. Look for the general trend, like how many days you have above it or below it. It's going to be a little bit more obvious when we get to the NASDAQ. But, yes, it's below the 50, and it's probing the 200. And at some point, we could get a death cross. You might want to go dust off all those death cross videos that I did last time we had a death cross in the moving averages. Now, looking at the 50 in the S&P 500, you could see that we had nice daylight for quite a while. Then we tested the 50 here, and I guess we sort of tested it here, and we tested it here, and we tested it here. And then now we have another test. And what's happening today? Well, looks like yet another test of the 50. Donald's out there making a lot of noise. It's like I uh, picked the wrong day in the forum to do a webinar. <laughs> now, again, this is kind of a good case in point. I pointed out that moving averages don't necessarily indicate anything, or any indicator doesn't necessarily indicate anything. But let's look at what these moving averages are doing. Look, the 10 has turned down. And right now, the 20 and 30 have turned down. Now, as I've said before, it's another little simple thing I learned from Greg Morris, but so important. You know, the more I learn in this business, the more I come back to the beginning. And that's why I did the trading full circle. It's like, just come back to the beginning. Come back to the basics. It's all there. Yes, there's a few more complex things. and There's some things you learn with time, tips and tricks, etc. But the basics are so damn useful and make a whole lot of sense it could really help you wrap your head around things and that thing that i'm getting to is that when a moving average an exponential moving average is crossed and the close is below that moving average that moving average will turn down let me zoom in so you can see that and if you go in and watch the first four videos of the trading full circle it's in there okay notice how this moving average is turned down here and turned down here 
it's a little bit more obvious here. The 20 turns down here and the 30 turns down here because the close is below it, okay? So again, nothing magical, but when these moving averages come together and cross over after all-time highs, it is cause for concern. Let's go back to the Russell real quick. Now, that Russell is triggering that entry right as I'm doing this, okay? And what have I been saying lately? About 136.5 will be a trigger. So this bow tie has officially triggered now, especially since it took out the top of this little, the bottom of this little gap. So officially, this is a short. So I'm not going to go crazy bearish or anything, but I have to recognize and accept that. Now, that's a two-day chart, that's a three-day chart, a four-day chart, a five-day chart, in other words, a weekly. So I'm going to begin to get concerned when the weekly begins to turn down and cross over and set up as a bow tie. Remember when the last time I got really worried about the market way back here? Well, it didn't turn out to be the mother of all bear markets, but... I forget what the Russell dropped. I think it dropped 18%. Well, 18% in an index is nothing to sneeze at, okay? If it goes up 18% a year, that's a pretty big deal. If it goes down 18% in a few months, month and a half, whatever it was, a couple of months, that's a pretty big deal. So you don't want to take these signals lightly. Uh, quoting Greg again, we take all signals as if it will become the big one. That's back when he was running five six billion dollars so a little questionable in the russell getting back to the nasdaq you can see that the moving averages have begun to turn well that's because the close is below it right so they will turn immediately and then let's throw the 50 in and you'll see once again we've had another couple of more tests with the 50 let's clean this up and then we'll i, I promise i'll move on quickly well, let me just put that 50 back on and you could see once again if we close somewhere down here we're testing that 50 yet again and again just looking at the slope of the moving average and the daylight as a general statement it will help to keep you on the right side of the market now Notice back here, it began to sell off and turn around and right back up. You don't want to hop in on the long side or the short side after just a few days of daylight, but begin to observe if you have daylight for a substantial amount of time. And I haven't quantified this or at least tried to quantify it lately. Years ago, I tried to quantify everything. But let's say you have 10, 20 days of daylight, then you could probably, it's probably safe, well, it's never safe in this business, but it's probably safe to say that, yes, we are in an uptrend or a downtrend, whatever direction that daylight may be. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not the end of the world, but I want everybody to pay attention. I want you to pay attention to the 50-day moving average. I want you to pay attention to the daylight there. I want you to pay attention to the slope. I want you to watch for weekly bow tie signals, such as what we just had in the Russell, to see if the NASDAQ and the S&P does the same thing. I would like you to keep an eye out in individual sectors to see if that begins to happen too. For instance, and I go through all of these 200-something sectors every day. This is just a sampling of them. But I noticed the M&C stocks yesterday, material construction. What have they done? Well, yesterday, officially, they made a bow tie down. You had all-time highs here, or at least multi-year highs. And then you had a sell-off. And you had the bow tie, and now they're triggering that bow tie today. So that's a little concerning. Everybody likes to look at gold. Well, let's look at gold. Well, gold's kind of headed higher as of late, but it's kind of in these mid levels. So somebody emailed me and said, Dave, we're in a bull market for gold. I don't know. I think it's too early to call the bull market there. But if it goes on to make new multi year highs, then maybe there is. If it at, at the least breaks out here, Okay, this is GLD. If it at least breaks out, then you could certainly start being a little bit more bullish, especially if you can get through some of this resistance back here. Okay. So that's gold. Uh, silver doesn't look quite as good. 
So I wouldn't call a bull market in silver, especially just yet, okay? I think someday we could have the mother of all bull markets in silver, but someday it could be a long ways away. Now, some areas are kind of hanging in there today, notwithstanding, like hardware was up towards the top of its range. Software hasn't looked quite as good. Let's see if I have it in here. In fact, let's just take a look at the major MIGs. That's usually a good thing to do. Whenever the market gets questionable, I like to look at the major MIGs. And the major MIGs are just the, the major groups of stocks. And let's see if we can get them sorted out here. And, you know, throwing something like the bow ties in might be a good idea. So the Fin stocks obviously doing pretty good. Maybe thanks in part to Kim Jong-un. But you can see a lot of these other areas beginning to turn down, beginning to look a little dubious in here. Banks, chemicals have lost some steam. There's software. Software is not too bad. It's not too far from all-time highs, okay? Consumer durables, bow tie down, pulling back, could trigger today. Non-durables losing some steam. Drugs, not looking so hot, okay? And this is a prime example of we had like Teva get hit in the drugs. And I think I talked about that last week. And the subsector got hit. And then some other stocks with the subsector got hit. And now the overall sector has gotten hit. And now you have a bow tie down to drugs. Semiconductors, not too far from all-time highs, but certainly have lost some steam. So we haven't seen forward progress here since what? Two and a half months ago, round numbers, or at least two months ago, two months and a week. Energies, obviously not so hot. Back to chart out a little bit. Looks like they want to come down here and test their recent lows. You're certainly only buying energies just yet, okay? Now, foods are doing okay. Now, should we get excited about food? Well, I get very excited about food, but not the food stocks. <laughs> foods are a defensive area, and when foods are headed higher, that means a possible flight to safety. Now, it's not a signal in and of itself, but a signal of something that you might want to pay attention to. Health services have been doing fantastic, but again, let's let's dust off that net net thing, and we can go back to June and see that not a whole lot of forward progress, two months and change. Okay, so I would encourage you to take a look at all these major sectors at the least to see what's happening. You can see insurance losing a little steam, turn it down. Longer term, still an uptrend. Internet losing a little steam. Kind of looks like the NASDAQ right about where it was or not far above where it was a couple of months ago. Leisure started to look dubious. Within leisure, there's a few areas that are setting up on the short side. Take a look at manufacturing, beginning to break down a little bit in here. Okay. Well, Dave, I don't know anything about markets. Okay. Well, here's the net net change. It hasn't done much in what? Four months. Okay. Go back four months ago. So at the least, it's sideways. M and C we just talked about triggering a bow tie today. Now keep in mind I'm a big fan of check back often, but right now look at a little dubious. Metals of mining overall, sands silver, and sands gold to some extent, although gold has improved, has been doing better as of late. I'm not that excited about it because I'd like to see it making some brand new highs in here. This could have some resistance to deal with, but. One day at a time. There are some subsectors within mining, metals and mining look okay, such as aluminium and steel and iron. Real estate, eh, not much to glean there. Just kind of choppy and sideways at best. Retail, well, retail looked kind of dubious, looked like it was going to go back and fake everybody out, and now it looks like it's kind of rolling back over again. Tobacco is broken down in here. Likely some debacle de jour bringing it down. Transports looking a little dubious. We have a bow tie down, kind of hanging in there, but that looks questionable to me. Now, again, check back off. Utilities still doing okay in here. So I seem a little bearish, right? Well, if this market goes flying straight back up, 
and then we may have dodged a bullet. But again, I don't want to beat the dead horse here. I just want everybody's eyes to be open as to what is out there. I would never, I know you should never say never, but I would never get out there and quote unquote call a top, ring a bell, tops here, you know? No. As a trend follower, it's gonna, I'm gonna be a little late to call that top, which I won't call, but I'll be a little late to get on board. Although there are cases where sometimes everything kind of stealthily, if that's a word, in a stealthy manner, everything kind of rolls over. And the next thing you know, you're in a bear market like 2007. All right. <laughs> Just heard a pop of a can that was open and bear. Oops, a beer <laughs> or a do. No, I didn't. Uh, I've been off to do lately. Uh, it just, you know, nothing's naturally fluorescent green. You know, I just kind of, not that I'm getting that much healthier, but I've been trying to get a little healthier. I, I can't, I can't kick the Diet Coke habit though. I got to at least have one Diet Coke a day. Uh, but yeah, that Mountain Dew, and I, I saw a commercial the other day. I'm like, man, that looks good. <laughs> I was drinking Diet Mountain Dew, so God knows the chemicals in that. All right, Craig says, large caps tended to be defensive. Q's R2000, SPY looking gatekeeper-ish testing major MAs. Yeah, you know, that's one thing that I might um, dust off. And the gatekeeper, I almost regret putting, putting Fibonacci in there because I'm not a huge Fibonacci fan, but there is something there where it stalls short of its prior highs. But, yeah, it's gatekeeper-ish. I wouldn't rush out and call a top just yet. But it is stalling a little short of its prior high in here, so that's somewhat concerning. You said the Qs. Um, the Qs are, are just kind of a little sideways in here, but they're kind of hanging in there for the most part. And that was my whole point about the Dow last week is that it's just 30 big cap stocks. And if a few of those begin to crack, obviously it could take it down. And they're also price weighted. And we looked at uh, some of the components there, I think, last week. So one of the problems with the big cap issue is that it's well analyzed, it's well watched, and often it can be priced for perfection. Now, price for perfection means that they can't stumble. So if they have a bad earnings or if they have a bad earnings forecast or whatever the case is, then things could get pretty ugly pretty quick. Okay, uh, let's go ahead. and I have a few questions I'm going to answer here, and then we'll go ahead and let's go ahead and open up for individual stocks. So we have a few to look at and we'll get there and we don't end up with uh, an impasse. Okay, Guy says, when you have a weekly bow tie – in effect, and you're long a stock, do you use a daily bow tie to trigger to add to a position? No, um, I I don't add to positions. And I just don't think it's a good idea. I like to, and this is one thing I was thinking about yesterday, I was working on a little psychology thing that I'm working on. And, and one thing I like to do is, is get into a position where I end up with a quote-unquote free position. And it's like I don't relax until um, I'm in a free position. Now, by free position, let's say we're playing a pullback. We get in here, and we have initial profit target of here. So it gets to here, and let's just make the math easy. Let's just say 200 shares. So we bought 200 shares here, and then we flip out 200 shares here. And our stop is now at break even. So the worst we could do, barring overnight gaps, is to scratch out at break even. So let's say this was plus five, okay? So we were looking to take profits when it's up five points. So now we have $500 we put into our pocket, okay? And borrowing overnight gaps, we have $500 in our pocket. 
Now we still have 100 shares on, so if this market continues 6.7 point, 8 point, 9 point, 10 points, let's say we're up 10 points now and we're trailing that stop higher, and we get, let's say the stop is five points away, well, we get stopped out, we'll still make, let's see, this is five points, and this is 15 points higher. We'll make another 10 points, so we'll make $1,000, okay? So it's better than poking the eye, not a bad trade. And you will have to give up some in the end. Now the question is, well, Dave, in your best trends, you have your smallest share size on. It's like, well, who cares, okay? And trust me, if you're trading, let's say, 2%, and this is 1%, you take it off, and now you have 1% left on, okay? Not This is not intended to be a complete money management lesson. Uh, I'm just trying to skim over it a little bit here, just to give the gist of it. That's still a substantial amount of money. Now, a 2.0 lesson or lesson 2.0 would be you flip out that 100 shares at a swing trade profit, and at some point along the lines, you get like a TKO or something, and then, yeah, you might be able to add that back on to where you're long 200 again and then flip off 100 for a swing trade profit. That's a little bit more advanced. That's called swing trading around a core position. And that can help. You're not going to get rich doing that, but it can help to make a little money. I don't do that publicly in the service, but privately I will do that. And it doesn't happen that often, though. But when it does, it could be a wonderful thing. And a lot of times I'll point it out to people like, hey, guys, this is set up again for those of you who miss the set up or those of you who might want to take some action. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, just to kind of let you guys know what's going on. But no, I don't add to positions. And if you think about it, if you're long a stock, as that stock goes higher, you've got more and more uh, your, your um, what is it? Is your exposure increases because the price of stock is higher, the stock is worth more. So I guess your, your overall exposure does increase a little bit. But as far as your money management exposure, if you get stopped out, you're obviously making a profit. Okay. Hopefully that made sense. If not, feel free to... Um, ask again but the other thing too is i'm not actually using once i'm in i'm in okay so if we go back to like the the chem once i'm in i'm in and i've done a lot of presentations where and people will email me and call me and say dave this thing like let's this wasn't quite a bow tie here but let's say you're in this stock from back here and then you've got a bow tie down. I think it was CNX had a couple of bow ties along the way before it finally tanked. Well, because you have a bow tie here, you don't want to bail out. Let's say your stop's here. Just let your stop get hit and take you out. Take a dumb approach, so to speak. Okay? Don't try to outsmart it by taking a new signal. Early in my career, I did a lot of stop and reverse type systems where, okay, I get a signal to buy here and sell here and buy here, et cetera, and you are always in the market. I've tested a little bit of everything. The best thing that I've found is just get in, flip out for that swing trade, and then hold on for what hopefully becomes a longer-term trend. And more often than not, what's going to happen is you get a swing trade profit, comes back in. You get a swing trade profit, comes back in. At the best, okay, and at the worst, obviously, you just stop out, flat out stop out. Well, if this happens, let's say, 10 times more than this, why even bother with this? Well, because this is where the real money is, and this is going to make your year with a 100, a 200, a 300, a 400% gain, especially if you catch a couple of those, okay? So take a lot of these to make any money, but these help to keep the lights on, help to keep you in business. And then another thing that I was thinking about recently in going through these columns, these old columns of mine, is from a psychological standpoint, it does help because at least you're making a little money over the shorter term. So there is, in addition to statistics, there's also some psychological backing and rewards, so to speak, help you get up that Maslow's ladder for both the short-term or needs or your basic needs moving on up towards the more esoteric needs and need to be right and need to be right big.
but the swing trade is going to kind of fulfill that that need for instant gratification that we have in this microwave society. All right, let's talk about some individual stocks. ALGN is the first one up today. And let's see what's happening there. One thing I'm seeing with this one at first glance is that it has lost some steam. I like stocks to go up and then accelerate higher. And you could argue, well, Dave, did it kind of take off here? Yeah, but it's kind of lost steam in this last little move. Now, let's see what happens when it knocks out, okay? Right now, it's not enough knockout move. So, yeah, put her in your momentum list. But based on this recent action here, I think I'd prefer if it would bust out to new highs and not look back for a while before maybe making another knockout move. But this would have to be a little bit deeper. And I probably would pass just because it's kind of lost a little steam in here. That is one big bar up, and then it kind of drifted higher. Don wants to know about DSWL. DSWL. Well, I was just thinking, I don't, I've never heard of this stock. The reason I've never heard of it is it's super duper thin. Uh, too thin to trade. Look at that. It's only traded, what, is that 4,200 shares today? So let's say you go in and trade 1,000 shares, which it would only be, what, $2,700 worth. You would be one-fourth of today's volume. One thing real quick, and this is another thing, again, I picked up from Greg, and I, I, I saw it, I knew it, but I didn't really think about it. I'd never wrapped my head around it. In order for technical analysis to work, you have to have a representative sample. Okay? Representative, blah, blah, blah. let me rewind that. Representative, easy for me to say, representative sample in statistical terms, and I think, if you're a statistician, please don't correct me, but you get the gist means that you have to have enough in the survey to make it valid, okay? So with technical analysis, you need enough people in the market to create that psychological bias or whatever. So let's say you've got one holder of this stock that has, I don't know, 100,000 shares, which wouldn't be too crazy. I mean, somebody out there might, be, might have 100,000 shares of the stock, it's only $300,000 for a big player, you know, or somebody who accumulated a lot of it. And they decide to dump 50,000 shares on the market. Well, the average volume for this stock is only 25,000 on average. So it's like that supply cannot be absorbed. So you got to be really careful in something thin like this and make sure you have a representative sample where you have enough people to read that psychology of the market. So that's a fancy way of saying it's too thin. But yes, it's in an uptrend, it's headed higher, but I would steer clear of that one. Donna wants to know about AVXX, AVXS. Um, well, first thing kind of jumps out at me is that it really didn't clear its prior peaks in here and it's pulled back to them. So it does look okay. I hear you as far as momentum is concerned, but I would pass on it based on that. I'd like to see a more decisive clearing of the prior peak and then that play that pullback along the way. Okay, any more? Got a quiet bunch today. Let's take a look at the spiders while we're waiting, and we'll take a look at bonds too. Um, spiders are looking kind of ugly, like uh, Craig pointed out, kind of gatekeeper-ish. Gatekeeper is simply when a stock or any other market for that manner sells off hard and then begins to uh, retrace back up but stalls out. For instance, and it's the closest thing to reversal that I really trade. I don't really like about the or the um, the long side, but on the top side, you have a market that tops out or sells off, I should say, and has a retrace but stalls short of its old high. Now the S&P kind of looks like kind of looks like this now. Okay, 
it needs to be a little bit more obvious. And as I often say, I don't trade directly off of classical technical analysis, but sometimes you'll have uh, a shoulder, a head, and then another shoulder over here, which turns into the gatekeeper, just like this could turn into a first thrust over here or a bow tie. But sometimes you'll get a gatekeeper with a big picture pattern working behind you. And usually, and I just eyeball it, I don't actually measure, but usually if you had to measure it, 618, 786, somewhere in there, okay, on the retracement. If you take a measurement, this would be 100%. So somewhere between 60 and 70% retracement of that slide. All right, we got a couple of stocks to look at. Jerry's got one. All right, thank you, Jerry. And we got a couple other ones. All right, Jerry wants to look at uh, CO. Yeah, that's going to be China Cord Blood Corporation. This is one that's in my momentum list. It's obviously had a pretty good run to it, and it should be in your momentum list too. I would look for something like a TKO type of move in here, some sort of hard sell-off, and then look to get on board. But, yeah, that's a trend. No matter how you slice it, that's a beautiful trend. But, yeah, it needs a pullback, obviously, on that. Bye-bye on a pullback for Dennis. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. She can't stop going. Bye-bye, 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 bye-bye. Ah, uh, maybe. Maybe. It's Sally Baba. Uh, yeah, we'll have to. We'll know when we see it. Um, pretty big gap here. Looks like it trades in chunks, which is fine once you're long, but it's hard to get on a stock like this. So yeah, if it can accelerate higher on a pullback, put that on your watch list. BA is going to be what Boeing. I'd almost rather wait and short Boeing than try to jump on. It's a big, thick stock, as you know. And let's see what's happening with the bow ties. Nothing yet. Um, it's lost a little steam in here. It would actually have to make new highs and then pull back based on the methodology. But if anything, I think your real opportunity in something like Boeing would be to wait for that bow tie. Google bow tie. Let's take a look at that. Speaking of it. You know, now might be a good time to dust off the go-go-nomo strategy. Yeah, it did bow tie. You kind of had like a double uh, a double type of bow tie. And sometimes those can be really powerful. When the euro topped, what year was that? Oh, I don't have those charts up right now. I should probably bring them up. But um, euro topped in 2007. or when, when did the euro top? I forget. But it had like a double bow tie. So, yeah, the... Uh, Google is bow tied down. I wouldn't rush out and short it. Doesn't look like the most fantastic setup in the world. But yeah, it, the more I look at it, though, the worse it looks. I mean, notice that you had the gap down off all time highs. That's never a good thing. And then now it's breaking down a little bit. But yeah, Google definitely in trouble. Amazon. You know, maybe now's the time to start looking at these uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse or whatever they are now. The fang stocks or whatever. I forget what they call them now. But, yeah, you got a gap down here. You got a bow tie. Now, see, this looks like a better short than, than the Google. It's a little bit cleaner. But, yeah, that's a stock that's in a lot of trouble. So read the go-go nomo. I think there could be a wonderful opportunity in these stocks that are beginning to get cracked. Apple. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of trading Apple. Um or any other big stocks for that matter, except sometimes on the short side. But it's kind of lost a little steam in here. I mean, it's uh, it's come back in. It's with that, that two or three weeks or whatever without much forward progress. So it would actually have to make new highs and pull back for me to get excited. NVIDIA. Well, NVIDIA looks like it's in a little bit of trouble. I think it'd be you'd be a little early to short it. But if it had to go 
long or short, I think it might be worth a shot as a short. And then your stop would be at new highs because that's where you'd be wrong. But I'd I'd almost rather to see it make a bow tie down before looking to go after it. But yeah, that's a stock that looks like it's in trouble. Why, why? That's a Nancy Kerrigan stock, huh? Why, why? I guess I shouldn't. Is it too soon to make that joke? Um, no, I don't like the gap down here. Um, as a general statement, I don't like gaps against the trend in a setup, okay? With something like a foreign stock, you're going to have gaps because they trade overnight, at least in a liquid way. But uh, no, this gap, I would I would eliminate that because of that. GE is still a blue chip. It's hit a blue chip. I deleted it too soon. Yeah, GE looks like it's in trouble. You know, GE is only $24, $25 a share. So what's going to happen? If you take a look at the Dow, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and here's where, you know, look at everything, guys. This is why I, I just look at so many charts every day. But what you need to pay attention to, let's take a look at the, the highest price stocks in the Dow. Okay. So when Boeing cracks, not if, when, it could hurt the market. Uh, Goldman's looking kind of funky in here. It's kind of sideways. But if Goldman cracks uh, 3M, you could see you got a gap down. You got to retrace back up. It's kind of uh, bumping up against resistance at 210. That looks pretty ugly. UNH looks okay, but again, on a bow tie, it'd be nasty. McDonald's pretty high levels. On a bow tie, it could hurt the market. Apple hanging in there so far. Now you can see Home Depot on a little bit more grandiose scale has a little bit of that gatekeeper action we're talking about. It's not perfect. If it's perfect, it looked like this and like that, and this would just be a few days down, usually about four or five or six, and then four or five, six up, roughly 10 to 11, 12, somewhere in there total. But on a two-day chart, maybe a three-day chart, you can see it is a little bit of that sell-off followed by retrace followed by stalling, so that's concerning. So keep an eye on these guys at high levels because – if they begin to crack, it'll take the Dow down with it. Obviously, IBM's in a downtrend. The two Johnsons, Johnson and Johnson, the two Johnsons, kind of sideways in here. So just pay attention to these. you got to look at everything. Two out of four fangs, stocks bow tied down from highs. Facebook, what are those? Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and Google. You see, that's, that's good analysis. Yeah, that's good to know, Howard. So it's good to look at some of these things. Uh, Netflix, you know, you had the big hoorah, but what have you done for me lately? We've now retraced almost all of that gap. Could actually bow tie down in here. Google's bow tie down. Apple is okay. Facebook. Yeah, Facebook's hanging in there so far. But you don't want to rush. I wouldn't rush out and buy it. Now it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So you, you have almost one month of sideways trading in here. Now, it's still in a longer-term uptrend. It still looks pretty darn good. But, yeah, when that begins to crack, when those fangs go, it could be ugly. Don wants to know about X-ray. Yeah, on a bounce, maybe. Um, but at this juncture, it's like I'd almost like to try to catch stocks before they crack. But, yeah, that looks pretty ugly. Uh, on a bounce, that could be a possible short for sure. Decent volume, so you probably should be able to get shares. JBHT is going to be a trucker. Um, no, it's kind of a... I kind of like, sound like Casuela. No, no, no. Uh, it's pushing into this overhead supply. So for me to get excited, it would actually have to break through that overhead supply and then maybe look to play a pullback along the way. But leave it alone for now. TMQ, I know that one for some reason. Why do I know this stock? Oh, because it's on the Landry list today. Usually I try to catch those ahead of time. Yeah, I like this one. Uh, a little bit on the thin side, obviously. 
Some bad memories way back here, but shoot, if it goes up 40%, I do like this one. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is probably the best looking stock I've seen so far. Now, it is thin based on the volume, and this is why that I wouldn't recommend it as a direct setup. If you're a small private trader, then maybe you can go after it because it's a couple hundred thousand shares a day, but it's still pretty thin for given the price of the stock. But yeah, that looks pretty good. You got a nice thrust higher followed by a pullback. That's what we're looking for. So high five, first high five of the day. Uh, I wouldn't have given it to you had to realize if, if it was on the Landry list. Yeah, now this is what a good looking short looks like, okay? Notice that you had this consolidation going sideways at high levels and notice that it broke down below the consolidation pull back a little bit. It's also now a bow tie. So yes, on the next bounce in here, this could be set up again. This is what you're looking for on the short side. Really good volume to make sure that you're not in a stock that's too thin that could get squeezed easily. But yeah, that's that's pretty good. If you gave it to me at uh, before the open, I'd give you a high five on that one. All right, we're almost out of time. You want to try to squeeze in a couple more? PM? Uh, no, kind of sideways in here. Um, but I hear you. It looks like it's kind of a major top in the works. It looks toppy, but it's not really set up. So I would leave that one alone for now. But I hear you. It's certainly lost some steam. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. As you can see, or as you can tell, I love doing these shows. And I, as long as you guys keep showing up, and girls, I will continue to do them. Any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Everyone have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.